and talk to me. Really? Yeah. These were little girls walking down the road. Go, go, go. Because of the shocking nature of the crime, there was a wide interest in what happened on that road. An entire town comes under suspicion. There were over 1,100 leads. We weren't worried about eating or sleeping. We were worried about finding the person who'd done this. You don't have to know why someone did it to prove they did it. Walitka, Oklahoma is an old railroad town set deep in the state's wide open prairie between Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Walika consists of about 1,200 people. It is made up mostly of ranchers, farmers. The Graham Public School draws students from Walika, as well as the nearby town of Henrietta, Oklahoma. 11-year-old cheerleader Skyla Whitaker is a relative newcomer to Graham, having moved to Walika just two years earlier from Baxter Springs, Kansas. She and her extended family live in town in a modest middle-class home. Skyla lived with her mother and stepfather, and she had a number of step-siblings from both her mother and father. Also on the cheerleading squad is 13-year-old Taylor Placker, Skyla's best friend. Oh, hey, Taylor. It's about time. All ready for tonight? Are you kidding? I cannot wait to see my future hunky quarterback husband. <laughs> you wish. Hey, I gotta go. I can't be late for science class again. See you at practice. Hey, bye. Taylor has just entered the sixth grade at Graham after being homeschooled. Taylor and Skylar did everything together. Their teachers said they were pretty much inseparable. How much homework did you get? I got a lot. It was I didn't. They liked to read the same books and hang out. They had different personalities, but they were both kind of spunky. So it goes like this. Ready? Okay. Give me they uh, laughed a lot, smiled a lot, enjoyed talking about everything imaginable, and that's how I got to know them. Although Skyla is a grade behind Taylor, the two hit it off from the start. Taylor is smart, but less outgoing than other girls her age. Taylor, because she was homeschooled, she didn't have a lot of access to other children her age. And then when she got in to the public school, I think that she probably had a lot of catching up to do socially. Graham! <laughs> How'd I do? So at 13, she might have been more comfortable with younger girls. Here we go, Dave. Taylor lives with Pete and Vicki Placker, her maternal grandparents. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts that we are about to receive from thy bounty. Through Christ our Lord, amen. 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 Another beautiful bird, Ma. <laughs> oh, thank you, Pete. Taylor's single mother, Jennifer, relies on her parents to help raise her daughter. Extended family members, cousin Chris and Pete's brother Daryl, are often at the Placker house too. Taylor shared a bedroom with Linda, her aunt, but she thought of her as a sister. Hi. Hey guys, what do you want? Kids meal. <laughs> kids meals are for babies. Hey, don't yuck my yums. Just order what you want. I'll have a kids meal. Okay, well I'll have two kids meals and I'll have a uh, number three. Taylor likes spending time with her aunt Linda. There you are. Thank you. For you. There you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. But Taylor likes spending time with Skyla most of all. Bye, honey. See you Saturday. Bye, Mom. Be good. Always. Rose Whitaker and her husband are leaving town for a weekend getaway. So Skyla gets to stay over with her best friend. The Placker family lives outside of Walitka on County Line Road. It's a rural area where the Plackers live. It's a country road that you, know, you pretty much only go on if you live in the area. This is mostly a road that locals travel. I heard you got in trouble with Mrs. Patterson. Um. Don't want to know what happened. <laughs> Do you want to look for some turtles? Sure. Let's go. They're usually like right over there, but. Do you see any? No. 
for the girls. A typical weekend always includes a walk up to Bad Creek Bridge, less than a half a mile from the Plackers' home. There's a bridge over a creek. It's not a real prominent bridge. You can kind of drive right over it and not think much about it, but this is where they used to go and, and play and catch turtles. They loved to go down to that bridge and the creek underneath there. They like to run around the country and, you know, just do things that Oklahoma girls do. Hey, you blow up there! Watch out! We're looking for turtles down here! Now, there were reports that there was other kinds of activity that went on at the bridge. Apparently, this was sort of a hangout spot for some of the local kids. It was known for people to go out and shoot. They would shoot into the creek just to be shooting a gun. Bitch can hit that bottle. Bet you I can. That's it. Watch where y'all shooting! And we had made several arrests in previous months of uh, people selling drugs, people going there to use drugs. Most of the arrests we made in that area of that bridge was related to methamphetamine. There were frequently be shell casings and things like that down there. Sounds like they're finished. I'm going to grab some. And Taylor was known for collecting shell casings from time to time if she found them. Don't you have enough already? Come on, let's go. Aww. I'm hungry. Okay. Hello? Hi, Rose. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. All right, see you tomorrow. Skyla, where's your mom? She won't be home till late. She'll pick you up tomorrow. Yay! Yay! So what's the biggest secret you have? Hmm. Yeah, I know Rich Crush on the quarterback. That's no secret. You know all my secrets. <laughs> what about you? Well, I have one, but I'm not sure I should tell you. Hey guys. It's 10 a.m. Did you go to bed at all? Nah, but we are now. Well, I gotta go to work. Guess it is summer vacation. <laughs> I'm kinda tired. Yeah, me too. <laughs> they'd stayed up all night long until 10 o'clock in the next morning. And then, in the afternoon, they get up and they ask to go out to the bridge again. Sit down and some breakfast, girls. It's about time you girls got up. What time did you go to bed last night? I don't know, Ma, but we want to go down to the bridge for a bit. No, you girls were up all last night. Plus, Skyla's mom's coming for any time now. Please, please, we won't be long. We just want to go visit with the turtles. Okay, okay, go. But don't be long. Let's go. <laughs> girls, you haven't eaten your cereal yet. house about 4.30 to walk down to the bridge. There was a passerby that noticed the girls walking and that was close to around 5 o'clock. Hey, could you please turn that down? Hello? Hi, Rose. Okay, we'll have Skylar ready. See you soon. Vicki Plecker started trying to reach Taylor on her cell phone, maybe like 513. Pete, could you do me a favor and go fetch the girls? Taylor's not answering the phone. Okay, be right back. Taylor! Skyla! 
Please answer when I call. Oh my God. Oh my God. Vicky. 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 Oh my God. Call the police. What is it? Call 911. What? I think they've been shot. Oh my God. Call. Hurry. 911, what's your emergency? Somebody shot two girls. My daughter. My grandbaby. And a friend. Your daughter's dead? I don't know. They went for a walk in the book. Okay, just stay on the line with me. On a summer Sunday evening, detectives from Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, OSBI, arrive at a grisly crime scene just outside Walika, Oklahoma. Thanks for coming so quickly. Of course. What do you got so far? Well, we got two little girls, 13 and 11, gunned down in broad daylight. Local girls? Yeah. All right, let's go. Blackard's a 13-year-old. She lives up the road here. Skylar Whitaker's her friend. She's staying with her. When I saw the two girls there, it strikes home. It uh, strikes your heart pretty quickly. And when I saw Taylor, the first thing I thought of was the position of her body appeared to have been posed in a sexual nature. We first thought maybe a sexual assault had tried to occur. Something had happened, scared the assailant off, and he had come back to finish what he had started. Investigators collect hair and blood samples from both girls and swab for DNA. Their underwear is sent to the OSBI's lab for testing. The DNA that we found was on their clothes. Some of it was on their shorts. Taylor was shot in the hip or groin area. Yet strangely, there are no bullet holes in her shorts. So Taylor's shorts may have been pulled up or off before she was shot. The offender did not want you to think the victim's shorts were off. The only reason to take off the victim's shorts is to gain access to their genital area. And the laboratory analysis of the victim's underwear found a sperm in both pairs of underwear. That right there tells you you have a sexual homicide. We were looking for any kind of prints that we could find, footprints, tire prints, anything that would help us determine what had happened. The team finds telltale traces of the weapon used. The evidence collected at the scene includes 540 caliber shell casings that came from a Glock. For the bodies, we recovered two 40 caliber projectiles and three 22 caliber projectiles. There were no 22 shell casings found at the scene. So if you don't find 22 caliber casings at a crime scene, you can assume maybe a rough is used. From the very start, it was determined there were two weapons involved. One was a 40 caliber Glock and the other was a 22. Taylor had been shot five times, Skyla eight times, a lethal barrage of 13 bullets in all. We found there to be more wounds than casings. This led us to believe that they were either picked up or the person firing the weapon was inside a vehicle and the casings had come back inside the vehicle. The discovery that two weapons were used makes investigators consider that there may have been two killers. bodies were found in a way that law enforcement thought one was trying to protect the other. Taylor was found in front of Skyla, and there was gun powder around the face, which indicates the gun was within 10 to 12 inches of her face. A portrait of the crime begins to emerge. Two shooters in a car on a remote country road no one takes by accident. Because of the location, it's very unlikely that you would ever end up on that road. Whoever was responsible for this was probably someone local who knew the area. 
and someone who knew the girls and their routine, and how they liked taking walks to the bridge. It's a very small community. It's a very remote location. Everybody knows each other very well. It's the middle of the day, so the people that had access to them were all people that they knew. Typically, in homicides, uh, the victim knows their killer. Detectives would look at family, friends, people who knew the girls, trying to find some kind of motive or reason that it happened. Okay, you got to give me some information. Let's start from the beginning. We started interviewing the families early on, not to prove guilt, but to prove innocence. Skyla's parents, the Whitakers, are immediately ruled out as they have just arrived home from a weekend out of town. Next, investigators narrow their focus to the Placker household. Where were you this afternoon? Well, Vicky and I were at home. The girls had gone to the bridge. I was watching TV. Had it cranked up pretty loud. So you didn't hear the shots fired? We didn't. Now what happened next? I got a call from Rose Whitaker. And that's when I tried to reach Scott and tell him, tell him to come home. I found him and I, and I hollered to Vicky to call 911. Who else was around? Well, after she called, I ran back out to be with my granddaughter until help arrived. That's when I saw him on the road. Another uncle happened upon the scene. Daryl! Daryl! Stop! Daryl, this has been horrible! Taylor's dead, Daryl! What? Oh my god. You blocked the road. I don't want anyone else coming up here. <laughs> Pretty soon, we've got lots of Placker family members out there. They find the bodies very quickly and control the scene very quickly. So the physical evidence is already under somebody else's control for about a half an hour. The question is, were the Plackers protecting evidence or were they hiding it? Within 24 hours of finding the bodies, law enforcement establishes a hotline urging anyone with leads to please come forward. Calls pour in. Immediately, names were starting to come in at that time. People calling saying, I think this might be your person. There were reports from individuals who saw the person of possibly Native American heritage with a baseball cap and the pickup truck in the area. On June 8, 2008, 13-year-old Taylor Placker and her best friend, 11-year-old Skyla Whitaker, are found shot to death, close to where Taylor lived. Now, with national attention all over the story, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation feels pressure to solve the case, and solve it quickly. We weren't worried about eating or sleeping. We were worried about finding the person who'd done this. One lead comes in that describes a Native American man in a white pickup truck wearing a baseball cap who was seen on that road the day the girls were killed. The white truck and composite sketch, did it ever go anywhere? Not really. That took us down a lot of roads that were dead ends. The day after the murders, investigators searched Taylor's room for any clues. Let's start with these. The red dress, the blanket, DNA testing reveals semen on Taylor's bed comforter. Agents must now consider men from the Placker household who had access to Taylor in her room. Amen. Then suddenly, a promising lead comes in. There was a witness who saw Chris Placker Jr. that day of the homicides out in the woods somewhere. 28-year-old Chris Placker, Taylor's cousin, happens to have a lengthy police record that includes assault with a deadly weapon. Agents compare Chris Placker's DNA with the semen found on his cousin's comforter. It matches. His DNA, his semen was found on a bedspread that was in Taylor's room where Taylor and Skyla slept. 
So obviously that was a concern to us. His explanation that he gave to the OSBI was that he and his girlfriend had had sex on that bedspread. Chris Placker says the rendezvous occurred several days ago. And on the day of the murders, he claims he was 85 miles away in Salisaw, Oklahoma. We interviewed his wife and she confirmed his alibi for that day that he was a couple of hours away in Salisaw. Also, the DNA profile from sperm found on the girl's underwear doesn't match Chris's, nor does it match any other member of the Placker family. After interviewing the family members, I found that there was no involvement on their part. Hearing about the Placker and Whitaker girls on TV, that's the most I had heard about it until I started working with Linda Placker. Hey, Linda. How you holding up? Really miss that little girl. She always had a smile on her face. She talked about Taylor all the time. She was very heartbroken about it. She was a sweet girl. And her friend Skyla, too. Just need them to find the person who did this. Any update with the investigation? Any new leads? Not really. It's still a mystery. Who would do such a thing? I remember hearing about when the two girls were killed at work and hearing about on the news. As soon as it happened, like, words started getting around throughout town. It did affect everyone. It shook up the whole community and all the towns surrounding it. Agents turned their focus to locating the primary murder weapon. Let me get that serial number. We decided it would be a good thing to have every registered owner of a Glock pistol to bring that Glock so we could test fire and match casings from those guns. OSBI requests that over 60 owners bring in their Glocks so investigators can test fire their weapons. The thinking was maybe somebody got an uncle's gun or a father's gun been used it and put it back. There were a lot of people who put their firearms out for us. Scores of owners come forward. Each gun is test fired and each owner swab for DNA. But none of the results yield a lead. All right, thank you. There were a lot of reports saying, no, no, this is not it, no, 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 no. Um, and the case kind of went dead. But about 10 weeks after the murders, with agents no closer to naming suspects, they receive an anonymous tip. I'm gone about the case involving those two little girls out on County Line Road. Uh-huh, right. I think Dustin may have been involved. Dustin Daly was a young man, and there were some rumors that he had made some admissions related to the girl's homicide. That's what I'm saying. I found this text. It says, I took care of the girls. I don't know what it means. 18-year-old Dustin Daly was part of a group of boys known to frequent the bridge and shoot guns off into Bad Creek. Watch where y'all show it! <laughs> <laughs> Dustin, agents discover, is a troubled young man who has threatened family members in the past and had been arrested for burglary. Agents take a ride out to Dustin's home. Your mother says you like to shoot guns. Who doesn't around here? There's not much else to do. What we got here, Dustin? That's my pea shooter. Careful you don't shoot your toe off. That's funny, Dustin. Because those two little girls were shot with a pea shooter just like that. What's the matter, Dustin? Nothing's funny now? Get in the car. The weapons are confiscated, and Dustin is swabbed for DNA. But he clams up when investigators press him. We attempted to interview him, and he would not interview with us. So we sent him before the grand jury and let them interview him. After Dustin Daly appeared before the grand jury, we immediately released him as a suspect. Uh, we believe that it was more a case of he was just bragging about something to make him look like a tough guy. He got a lot of publicity out of it, and I think that's what he wanted. Investigators find themselves at yet another dead end. There's a long gap where there was not much information about suspects. People were without answers for a long time. 
and it was frustrating to them because they were really worried that there was a killer out there on the loose. Desperate for answers, investigators ask veteran criminologist Brent Turvey to re-examine every piece of evidence gathered so far. They can only hope Turvey's experience in profiling can point them toward a child killer. Every person who's involved tangentially with these girls should be taken aside and their life should be split wide open and investigated. By 2009, a year has passed since two young girls were shot to death on a deserted country road in Oklahoma, near the tiny town of Ulitka. Neil Plackard, 13-year-old. Skyla Whitaker, her friend. These were 11 and 13-year-old girls walking down the road, doing things that little girls do. Look, the sun's starting to go down. It didn't make sense. It didn't seem to me any rhyme or reason as to why they would be assaulted the way they were. Agents have investigated several strong persons of interest and test fired a lot of guns. But they still don't have a suspect. The OSBI has issued a reward of $160,000 to anyone with tips that lead to an arrest. The case was still very much in the public consciousness. Parents were still on edge about letting their children go play. I don't think the OSBI has been under more pressure to solve a crime than this one, ever. Desperate for help, agents hand the case file to criminologist Dr. Brent Turvey in the hopes he can provide a more detailed perspective on the murders. I take the victimology. I take the crime scene behavior, the crime reconstruction. And using that, I infer the characteristics of the offender. In this case, it's fairly straightforward. You have to have somebody who's knowledgeable of the location because you can't just stumble upon it. You have to have someone who knows the victims because they're specifically targeted. And you have to have someone who possesses the requisite knowledge of firearms to use them effectively. They also more likely than not have access to a vehicle. It's not some uh, random event. But a random event not far from the crime scene may just break the case wide open. One of Linda Placker's former fast food restaurant co-workers, Kevin Sweat, and his girlfriend, Ashley Taylor, get pulled over in a routine traffic stop. So you know you ran that stop sign back there. I'm sorry, officer. I guess I didn't see it. Need you to get out of the car. What? Out of the car. Is he coming Sit right over there. You too, ma'am. Right over there. What? Right over there. this I got pulled over Ash kind of got me into pot into marijuana and we got busted for possession the highway patrolman pulled out a black gun case I did used to own a Glock a Glock the same kind of gun as one of two weapons used to kill the girls over a year ago in Walika. I, I sold that a while back because I needed the money. I sold the gun without its case, but I didn't realize I still had the case. Hey. I came across a girl that was looking for a gun and basically I was desperate, so I told her, hey, I got this Glock if you would want it. You have the money? Yeah. I remember her just being a white girl, and I can't remember her name. That's all I can remember. It was a while ago. Okay, so where'd you get the gun in the first place? I bought the Glock just after my 21st birthday. He had bought it from Henry, a police officer. Hey, officer. You got the money? Right here. are able to track the gun to the police officer who confirms Sweat's story. We're good. He said, uh, yeah, I sold the gun to Kevin, but I didn't remember the specifics. I know it was a Glock 40, but I can tell you what the serial number was or anything like that. Up against the car. Kevin Sweat and Ashley Taylor are arrested for possession of a controlled substance, but then released on a suspended sentence 
since it was their first offense. Investigators want to learn more about the Glock enthusiast, Kevin Sweat. A lot of red flags with the pictures he had posted. There were pictures of him holding guns, with him waving guns. He appeared to be more than just a gun enthusiast. There appeared to be something cynical about the way he looked, the way he dressed, and the way he would hold the guns in the pictures. As far as those pictures and stuff, I think it was just his way trying to look tough. And uh, he's an odd. The boy could throw a punch if his life depended on it. Is my Kevin in some kind of trouble? No, ma'am. Just doing some very basic investigating. That's all. He did like his guns. My ex always had guns. It's a good-looking 22, Dad. Want to see it? Well, sure, son. So I've been around him my whole life, and uh, Kevin liked them too. Come on, let's go. Want to try it? Oh, sure, you can try it. But, ma'am, you know where Kevin might be now. I don't know where he went off with that girlfriend of his. Kevin, I went to go put on my wedding rings, and they disappeared. Do you know what happened to them? How would I know what happened to him? It's Ashley. That, that's it. That girl's got to go. It's just the push Kevin needed. By July 2011, Kevin and Ashley have moved out of Mrs. Sweat's house, got their own place, and are planning a trip to New Orleans to get married. You ready? Oh, yeah. Ashley was very excited about it, told all of her family. They were going to be gone for a couple of weeks. It's a good thing he never married that thief. And then the next thing you know, Kevin's back working. And Ashley's nowhere to be found. Is this what you want? Huh? Is this what you want? Three years after two young girls are killed in Walika, Oklahoma, a third young woman, Ashley Taylor, goes missing. Her fiancé, Kevin Sweat, was the last person to see her. Hey. Hey. Sweat also owned a Glock. This is it. One of the weapons used to kill the Walika girls. But he claims to have sold it to an anonymous young woman. Oklahoma investigators pick up Kevin Sweat for questioning. So, Mr. Sweat, we already know that you like Glock handguns. Now we hear you were in love, about to get married. What happened to your fiance, Ashley? Kevin said that they were traveling south to go get married and, and they got into a fight. I can't believe you think I stole your mother's no, jewelry. No, that's not what I said. Would you really think I would do something like that? Come on, Ash. Would you want to marry somebody who stole your mother's jewelry? You're right. We're through. Fine, you know what? Is this what you want? Huh? Is this what you want? You are being ridiculous. No. Where are you going, no, Ashley? No, leave me. Get away from me. <laughs> I'll chase you around all day, Ashley. Leave me. What are you doing? Is this do what it. you want? Do it. Are you trying to tell me that Ashley killed herself? Well, I guess I helped her along. Give me the knife, <laughs> Ashley. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it for you. You're crazy. I don't love you, and I never loved you. He said he cut her with a knife and rolled her into the lake. The OSBI looked at the pier and found no blood. They searched the lake, and they found no body. Come on, Kevin. We're going for a ride. When the search expands to nearby properties, investigators are shocked by what they discover at Kevin Sweat's father's house. Agent, we got something. In a fire pit out back, they find charred human bones. There was also personal items such as glasses that were consistent with the same type of eyeglasses that Ashley wore. There's something else. The casings are from a 40 caliber Glock pistol. 
like those found at the crime scene of the two young girls from Walitka. We just found a whole burning pile of trouble for you in that fire pit. Hands down your back. On August 15, 2011, 25 year old Kevin Sweat is arrested for the murder of his fiancee, Ashley Taylor. But is he also responsible for the deaths of 13 year old Taylor Placker and 11 year old Skyla Whitaker three years earlier? To find out, OSBI compare the 40 caliber shell casings found near the girls' bodies to those found in the fire pit where Ashley's remains were recovered. In an incredible stroke of luck, they sent those spent shell casings to Terrence Higgs. We were able to identify those casings from that burn pile back to the ones that were submitted in 2008. The ballistic evidence points to the same person pulling the trigger of the same Glock at both crime scenes, Kevin Sweat. Kevin Sweat also fits key elements of the criminal profile. He was a local who knew the rural road, knew the victim's family, and owned a Glock and vehicle. Law enforcement presented it as he just was driving in the area, he has family nearby, it wasn't uncommon for him to be in the area. That was their theory, is that he pulled up in a car on the girls. But Sweat maintains his innocence and offers an alibi. June 8th of 2008, when the girls were killed, I remember like uh, going out and visiting uh, family, which they live basically in the area where the girls were killed. Investigators suspect he was visiting the area not to see family, but to scope out two young victims. Maybe he was driving by from time to time just to see if he had an opportunity. We do know he was familiar with the area. We know that you were there that day when that happened with those two girls. And let me ask this, how first, I mean, like, urine, blood, listen, hair, can, blood. Okay, listen. Because I've been down okay, that road okay. before. And, and listen. Sweat is questioned for two and a half hours, all of it recorded on videotape. What was going on in your mind that day that that happened? I sure as hell don't know. He denied murdering those girls at least 200 times. Did the girls say something? Did the girls no. throw something? Or, or what happened? What happened that day that set you off? There would be no point of shooting kids. But then, suddenly, Sweat changes his tune. Okay, so you saw two demons. Is that what you're telling me? He kind of breaks down and starts to relent a little and say, I thought two monsters came out and maybe that's why I shot them. And he said he shot them with a 40 caliber Glock. 